Welcome to Down and the movie begins with a little dude watching a short film about an adventure going to this place called Paradise Falls with a bunch of dogs to bring back a super rare undiscovered bird alive to show all his science friends how cool he is. Kids are like, whoa bro, then he runs off playing and finds this old raggedy shitty house with a female child inside of it that has the same passion for this dude Charles Munts uh, explorer guy as this little kid. She's a bit creepy but kind and after she breaks his arm, she. She breaks into his house at night. That is totally normal. I see no red flags here. Anyway, she shows him her top secret adventure book where she wants to go to Paradise Falls just like this guy Charles and she's left a bunch of pages empty for her adventure there when she gets there. Then she makes some promise to take them there when they grow up. No pressure. And she leaves and because he's a dude, the power of bonus is super strong so he grows up to marry her. And we start a montage of their life together where they buy the fucked up house and immediately get to work fixing it up. They don't even take their wedding clothes off. Do you know how uncomfortable not to mention dangerous it is to work in a wedding dress, you fucking shit beans? Anyway, they fix up the house. We find out their names are Ellie and Carl. Nice. No promises on sticking to them though. They turn the house into the gay dream house of their childhood. He needs to do more cardio. He sells balloons. She's a bird person. Then they decide to make bibis together but turns out her baby oven is kaput. Either that or his piss pump supplies lackluster baby mix. But I do think it's her ovaries though. Point is, baby is a no-go and she depresso as pressure over that. So to cheer her up, he's just saving up to go to Paradise Falls finally. But problemo after problemo cucks them from doing that. Stop breaking bones, fucking Carl. Also, if you really want to speed this process along a bit, you should look into shifting your career from selling balloons to something a bit more lucrative. Might I suggest meth. Continuing with the montage, they grow old together and forget the whole Paradise Falls ordeal, but Roblox man after years and years and years remembers it and I guess he has the money now so he buys plane tickets to surprise Ellie but oh, hold on, Paradise Falls is in Venezuela bro do you know how dangerous Venezuela is? Doesn't matter cause Ellie's sick and eventually she dies. Pretty sad shit, apparently lots of people cried. I didn't but I think that's probably cause I have no soul, just take the internet's word for it, it was pretty sad. On to present now movie time, Carlito goes about his sad daily routine for us to find out that his neighborhood has been turned into a concrete jungle and some business fucker wants to buy his house and Mr. Potato Head comes over like boss man's willing to offer double his last offer for your property. Oh, is he? Let me talk to him. Hey, faggot! Yeah! Gay vampire looking ass bitch! You can kiss my wrinkly little ass, boy! Yeah, I'm not with him! You can have my house when I'm dead! He goes inside and after a little while he gets a knock on his door from this little killer bean looking ass dude named Russell. He a boy scout and Carl's just like, no. And shuts the door, but then... Opens the door again, turns out Russell wants to get his assistant the elderly badge and won't leave Carl alone. So Blockface makes up this story about this annoying creature snipe thing, alright, and tells him to go find it if he wants to help him and he'll sign his thing for him. You know, if you really wanted the kid off your back that bad, you could have just signed the paper that said that he helped you and just be done with it and write how he helped you by avoiding a headache and leaving me alone. I thought old people were supposed to be wise. So dumbass kid goes out to find the snipe and Bulldozer comes along and backs up into Carl's mailbox and Mark Zuckerberg tries to help like, Oh my god, I'm so sorry, don't touch that! I can fix it, go steal someone's data, cunt, I can help! Ah! <laughs> He has a tennis ball at the end of that cane, right? How the fuck does it do so much damage? I guess it's possible, but still. Mark's pussy face is bleeding, and since this is the great US of A, we get lawsuits, baby! Fuck yeah! Can you smell that? It's freedom, motherfucker! Queer vampire sues his ass and gets the house and forces his Carl to go into a retirement home. You know, maybe if Carl didn't run away like a bitch and just apologize right then and there, and then they wouldn't have this problem, but I doubt it, because, you know, this is land of McDonald's. They will celebrate at the whiff of a lawsuit. That night, he's told to pack up his shit to go to a retirement home next day, but stumbles upon Ellie's old adventure book, so he looks at it and then and looks at the old people home brochure like Faggot shit. Oh, a toy. And next day when the retirement home people come, he releases the Kraken. A shit ton of balloons rise up and rip the house from the ground and he flies away. Now obviously, this is impossible. Ripping a house from its foundations by a bunch of balloons is just a tremendous amount of horse shit. But who cares? He flies through the city and sets sail for Paradise Falls. Wee! And he sits down peacefully in his chair, but then... Turns out to be Russell. You see, he thought he found the snipe and followed under the porch. It turns out to be just a tiny mouse. And then the house took off and here we are. However, I have a question. He said he was hiding under the porch. So where, 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 where the fuck is this kid in these images? And also later on, we find out that Russell can't climb for shit. So this is cat piss right here. Anyway, he lets him in. Kid's annoying. He fantasizes about killing him. Then he tries to lower the house by cutting off some balloons from this fireplace where they're all attached to the house. But then they approach a cumuloid nim bitch, all right? That's a cloud, storm cloud. They go inside it and plates crack, shit falls. And he's like, no, my stuff. And we cut to later when he titled his stuff down and he's passed out there. And Russell steered the house to South America using his wilderness explore DPF that he immediately loses. And Carl doesn't believe that they're in South America. So he takes the bird down to get the kid home. And and they pass by some rocks and he's like, what the hell is that? And they crash into the ground and fall off and save the house from flying off a cliff. By the way, this guy, this old frail old man, is supposed to have all his bones shattered and or dislocated. And he's gonna keep doing shit like this and be completely fine afterwards. So I'm just gonna pretend he's some sort of invincible mythological god or something and just move on, okay? So the fog lifts and he sees that they're super close to Paradise Falls and the final resting place that he wants to put his house in. And cause Carl has sausage arms and can climb, he decides to walk his house over there. By the way, if Russell could have made it up, he wanted him to hoist him up. That's why a 12 year old kid should hoist a fully grown 
man up. Yeah, that was never gonna happen. Also, now that he has decided to walk the house over there and set it down, he has in effect given up on the idea of taking Russell back home. Just saying. So dipshit Russell decides to help and they have to get to move him quick because the healing will the balloons in three states. They wear the house like a backpack and Russell takes his shit in the jungle and with the help of some chocolate, he finds a big gay ostrich. Brings it over like I found a snipe. Listen, kid. That's oh my god, but th there's no such thing as a snipe, dude. Can we keep it? Of course not. They keep it. Then they meet a dog with a collar on it that allows it to speak. Yes, he's a very good boy, okay? His name's Doug. And he has been tasked by his master to find a bird. And it turns out that the big guy ostrich, Kevin, all right, that's his name, Kevin Malone, is the bird he was looking for. He's like, can I take your bird as prisoner? Please, 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 oh, please be my prisoner. Then we cut to another pack of dogs, also searching for Kevin Bacon. And they check their colors to see that Doug has a bird on their little tiny screens that have GPS location. How the fuck is this technology available 80 years ago? Whatever, I guess 1920s fucking movie signs. Haven't used that one in a while. Anyway, they contact the good boy and see he has the bird and run to his location. Meanwhile, the duckster has made Carl his new master because he loves him so much, but Carl is running dangerously low on fucks to give, and he wants to get rid of both him and Kevin. So he throws a ball and some chocolate, and both Doug and Kevin run after them respectively, and he tries to run away far, far away, but that does not work at all. That's no good because they still find him. I mean, you're not that hard of a target to find, you dumb old fuck. You literally have a floating house attached to you. Anyway, they camp under the shelter of the house at night from the rain, and it is revealed that Russell's dad doesn't give a crap about him, and next day Kevin's gone, but not really. He's on top of the house stockpiling food to take it to his kids. That's right, Kevin is a girl. It's official. Kevin is a gender neutral name. If you don't agree, eat a dick. Up has spoken. So Kevin takes some food and says goodbye and goes off to his bibbies, but his ostrich spidey sense tingles. And we cut back to the floating house gang where the dog pack jumps onto them and asks Doug, where is the bird? Ah yes, the bird is the word. Ah yes, I could see how you would think I have the bird. Uh, tomorrow. Come back tomorrow and I will have the bird. Yes. Dumb bitch, you lost it. Then the dogs force the gang to come with them to their master as prisoners and we see Kevin on top of the house. Okay, I know this once, but how the fuck does it get up there, especially without getting noticed? No way it can fly, Ugh, whatever. They take him to a cave and lots of dogs show up, then Charles Muntz shows up. Yup, he's still alive and he's still here looking for this fucking bird. He takes one look at their mode of transportation and decides that they're not a threat and Carl goes, Holy bazookas, that's Charles Muntz, oh my god! Oh boy, I don't give a fuck. So Charles invites them in for dinner and they park their house next to his big fuck off blimp and he's trains the dog to be servants and make dinner for him and do everything for him and he has not left this place because he's still looking for this bird but he can't catch it because he's escaping into this labyrinth place. I've lost so many dogs in there, blah blah, people try to come here and steal my discovery. Blah blah blah. I just want to mention that Charles must be at least 80 years old, and the fact that he might be having sex with his dogs is not too far fetched of a theory. I'm just saying. Anyway, shit dick suspicion keeps arising, and they both see Kevin on top of the house, and Carl uses this as a distraction to get out of the blimp and takes his house, and the dogs go after them. So Jesus takes the wheel. Sorry, Kevin takes the wheel, and a bunch of balloons pop while Doug tries to help them out and slow down the rest of the dogs, but he almost gets thrown off a cliff himself. Then they jump this gap, or rather float across this gap, and make it to safety, but Kevin has been bitten, and Russell's like, we gotta get it back to his babies. This fucking kid. Alright, let's go. So they walk through the night to get to the labyrinth where these babies are and no way the balloons aren't popping here they're floating at branch level come on this is donkey dung i'm mixing it up here with the fucking you know the animals and the feces you see what i'm doing here anyway they get to the entrance of the maze and the fastest healing bird ever limps over there but Munch shows up you see he tracked him down using doug's collar because it has a gps track remember he traps kevin and tries to burn down and calls house balloons popping and shit and forced between freeing kevin and saving his house he chooses his house and then swoops in and takes the bird then russell goes you gave away kevin i didn't set out for this shit all right i'm not your master too and he calls doug a bad dog. Now listen here, you racky old piece of shit. You take that back, cunt. Anyway, he decides to take his barely airborne house to the falls with or without the help of fucking Russell. He gets there, parks it there, kind of crooked, ain't it? And Russell goes, fucking, you're a dick. I hope you get polio. Dude goes in the house, tidies up a bit. <laughs> Spell like titties. <laughs> Alright, focus. No time, no time. Okay. Guy sits down in his chair, checks Ellie's adventure book to see that she has filled out the pages of the stuff I'm gonna do section with pictures of the two of them. And for some reason, this is more touching to me than the montage in the beginning, but I still didn't cry. I'm, I will not cry. I'm, I'm soulless, goddammit. I'm strong. I'm soulless. <laughs> Bane decides to help Russell get back Kevin, but Russell has helped himself to some balloons and leaf blower to go save Kevin himself. And he's like, no. Then he tries to move his house, but it won't budge and goes, ah, fuck this chair. Oh. And he gets the idea to shed weight from the house to make it float. And he does that. And he finally takes off enough weight to make the house take off once more. And Doug shows up at the porch and he's a good boy now. Yay. He was supposedly hunting on the porch as well, but I didn't see him when it took off. Does this porch have a secret compartment? How do porches work? I don't know. Russell finds a blimp somehow, goes inside and gets caught. And then Dick Mitchum does the classic. I'll tie the protagonist to a chair and let some weird fucking mechanism kill him really slowly so he has more time to escape move. Then Clark... 
Clarl. It's not Clarl. Then Carl closes in on the blimp and sees the kid being lowered to his death and he goes to save him. I don't know how the balloons aren't hitting the bottom of the blimp and popping to be honest. And aren't they supposed to be having trouble breathing? How high up are they? It doesn't matter. Carl tries to keep Bean Boy safe but Bean Boy wants to help so Carl and Doggo go inside and distract other Doggos with the ball and free Kevin while Russell frees himself and fucks up big time. Mint Man sees dipshit Russell and sends flying dogs after him which is funny and hilarious stuff because dog fighters. I get it. But now I'm trying to shoot out the fucking balloon and said they aim for the tiny target that is the kid. Fucking dumb bitches. But you know, what am I complaining about? They're fucking dogs flying planes using chew toys. Why am I even... <laughs> Moving on. Munz fights Carl and they fight each other while Doug runs away from the other dogs and humiliates the alpha and accidentally becomes the alpha dog himself. You know, like Toothless and other dragons, he's their leader now, okay? Then Carl and the super healing bird climb the side of a blimp and try to knock off Munz, but he survives and Russell finally learns how to climb rope. The dog fighters crash out because Squirrel, by the way, the fight Carl had with Munz, he gave him a good whack on the head with a stick, right? And Munz didn't bleed while Mark had a fucking explosive period in his head. How's that possible? Doesn't matter. I guess Munz is fucking built different. So Roadrunner and Minecraft reunite with Airbutt on the roof and Killer Bean brings the house over, but Musket Man shoots some balloons off with the rifle and the thing slides off, falls down a bit and starts sliding off the blimp, but Carl the Norse God gets a hold of it from the fucking garden hose and he keeps it on board cause he's fucking Zeus or something. And once tries to break in the house and get the fucking bird and he does that and then Carl gets a brainwave, right? He's like, chocolate! And Russell and Doug hold on to Kevin, he shoots through the fucking window. The garden hose says adios, Munz falls to his death, but motherfucking Carl got a death grip on that motherfucking hose, man. And he saves these idiots while he sees his house float down into the abyss. Uh, is that an abyss? No, it's just the sky. Never mind. We transition to Kevin getting back to his kid, then Carl assumes ownership of the airship and leadership of the dogs that's a lot of ships there and they get back to their town or city for Russell's badge receiving ceremony and his dad ain't there but Carl is and he gives him the Ellie badge and I don't know if this bitch is his mom stepmom maid caretaker or whatever but she seems hella okay with the fact that the kid's been missing for three fucking days also what the hell is wrong with this kid his cat died or something is he constipated doesn't matter movie ends with them parking their blimp on top of a ice cream shop cause that's fine that's legal no problem with that and his old house very conveniently resting in the correct spot on Paradise Falls which you might call luck but I call it Camel Dookie this movie gets Eight schnozes out of eight Cessna 172s. Welcome to Coraline, and right away we got a weird ass creepy doll floating through a window that gets remade by Edward Scissorhands, then chucked back out the window. Cut to Coraline and her family who are moving into the pink palace, which is like a house that's split into three apartments. There's a basement, and in the middle part, and there's a what's it, the attic? Yeah. In the basement, you got Spunky and Bunky, two old British actor hoes that are now retired. I think they believe in voodoo and witchcraft and all that shit. And, and you know, Bunky, she, she she Bunky. And in the attic, you got a blue Russian man, Ivan Pachenkov, who has the physique of a great that has been impaled by a fucking matchstick and trained circus mice. Now back to Coraline on the fam bam. After they move in and put all their crap in the house, she goes out for a walk to look for a well, hears a noise and throws a rock, then hears a meow and she's like, oh no, what could ever be making that meowing noise? I'm in grave danger, I must run away immediately. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's just a fucking cat, but whatever. So she runs away, but the cat catches up and startles her. Now this cat is an important character in this movie actually, but I have no idea what it's called, so I'm gonna call it Dave. Dave the cat, okay? Dave spooks her that a creepy dude at top of a hill comes along and he's like, who be it down there? Comes down, almost runs her over, and it turns out to be YB, some kid that lives nearby who has serious neck and back issues. Seriously, dude, you need to see a fucking chiropractor or some shit. It's not healthy. Then Coraline's like, I'm from Pontiac, and he's like, I'm from Saab. My name's Coraline. Oh, Caroline. No, it's fucking Coraline. Best not get wrong with her. He shows her the well she's looking for and tells her that looking for water with sticks is retarded, especially because this one is poison oak. Then he leaves because he's being summoned by his grandmother. So she goes home to, it starts to rain and she starts to pester her mother about playing in the rain, but her mom's just like, shut the fuck up kid, I'm trying to work. And Coraline discovers a package that YB left for her on the doorstep and it turns out to be a doll that looks exactly like her. Now look Caroline, I'm about to school you away on some very valuable life lessons, okay? When some creepy dipshit you've just met sends you a doll that looks exactly like you, that's called the nope situation. You go, nope, and send that shit back, burn it, get rid of it, whatever, it doesn't matter. Just don't keep it, okay? But she doesn't do that because she's a freaking retard, keeps the fucking doll, goes over to annoy her dad, and he's like, listen, mate, I'm trying to work here, you fucking twat, okay? Just fucking go you can't the specs on the fucking ceiling or some shit, alright mate? So she goes to explore their old new house and this problem would be fixed if you would just pull any end of that rug, you stupid child. Some more exploring happens, her dad forgets to press save and she nags the crap out of her mom to unlock this tiny door in the wall that the creepy doll teleported to once again. Very nope, but whatever. Mom comes along, unlocks the shit, opens the door and ain't nothing but a brick wall behind it. And how the hell does this door even close with this doorknob on the other side? It's just eyeballing it like that. The brick wall doesn't seem deep enough in there for the door to close without hitting the doorknob. 
know, you know, it doesn't matter. Day goes on, they feed her trash and the doll is still there. She goes to bed and gets awoken by a mouse that leads her to the tiny door that no longer has a brick wall behind it, rather a cosmic anal cavity. She crawls through and ends up in an alternate version of reality where her mom and dad both have button eyes. Which for a kid has to be creepy as balls. Coraline, if I were you, I'd book it out of there so fast that galactic rectum would turn to a bleached asshole once I'm out of there. But whatever, Button Fam's being nice to her, being a good food and drinks, having a cool house, super colorful and very nice, being all like, we're your other family. We're not creepy at all. They up some shit on her hands that removes poison oak rash. They put her to bed, watch her sleep, and she wakes up in the trash house with her poison oak rash gone. And a brick wall behind the tiny door again, and she tries to tell her parents what happened, and shows them that the rash is gone, and her mom's just like, yo, kid, you been doing drugs? And tells her to go tell the story to the dingbats in the basement. She goes to do that, but on the way, she goes up to Mr. Ivan to give him some crap that came in the mail for him, and he goes, oh, Tsuka, boy, these chills came in the mail. Oh my god, I cannot believe it. I'm going to use these chills to train my mice. She leaves, but on the way down, he forgets to tell her something, so he drops down, almost gets castrated, and he's like, hey, Caroline, my mice are telling me to tell you not to go to the small door, whatever that means. That's redundant. She moves on, gets a hat from the car. Why do you have a suitcase nearly half the size of the roof of your car dedicated entirely to one hat? Unimportant. She goes down to Spunky and Bunky. They tell her fortune through some tea, but can't decide on what it is. Bunky calls Spunky's eyes gay. She calls her blind, and Coraline leaves without telling them the story. And now it's Foggy outside, and she sees that Wibby's stalking her. He has a photo shoot with a slug. He tells her that his grandma used to live here with her sister when they were kids, and that the house is dangerous. Then he leaves again. That night, she follows the mice and finds the mesmerizing sphincter again, goes through it, sees Button Dad gardening in a giant bug that turns into a helicopter. They eat, and Button Mom introduces Button YB, who she took the ability to speak away from. Not weird at all. Coraline and Button YB go up to Ivan Pachenkov to see a mouse show that he made for her. They get up there, find a bunch of cotton candy cannons and a cock that should sell popcorn, and... Did Dimwit YB just activate all the cans at once? Never mind. The show starts, the mice do some shit, the show ends, clappy clappy, ah yes, really thank you. The mice crawl up, Ivan sleeves, and the button people put her to sleep. Alright, listen kid, I know you really like this place, and you're very young, so you're allowed to be somewhat of an idiot, but in what world is inviting your barely even a friend over to watch you sleep normal? Whatever, she wakes up in the shit house where her mom locked the tiny door so she could shut up, and they go into town to buy Caroline her school uniform, and oh my god, I watched this movie when I was a kid, how the hell do I not remember anybody having such massive anime? boobies. Must have been very innocent back then. Anyway, they're buying her the school uniform, but her mom won't buy her these cool gloves. And she's like, mom, you a bitch. They get home and her mom's like, well, I'm off to go buy some food. Are you kidding me? You were just out buying clothes. Why didn't you go grocery shopping too? Don't tell me you forgot, because you clearly mentioned it back when you were eating slime, you fucking imbecile. Anyway, she leaves, Coraline finds a key to the tiny door, opens the door, and the space asshole's there. She crawls through and finds that button mom has left her a bunch of clothes, food, and a note to go down and see a show that Spunky and Bunky are making for her. So she does that, but on the way, she sees Dave. And she's like, you must be the other cat, but you don't have button eyes. Nah, homie, I'm me. Ain't no other cat down here. Also, I heard you call me a pussy. Now I might be a cat, but I ain't no pussy. Apparently, Dave frequently travels to these different realities, and in this one, he can talk. But what I understand is how he gets here. He says he does this a lot. He frequents this place to fuck with the button mom. So is there, like, another door? Because the other one was locked for years, so how the hell do you do that? But whatever, it's Dave the magical cat. He tells her that this place ain't a dream, it's just fucking bullshit, and that the button mom's an evil hoe, which she does not believe because he's an idiot. Then he goes off to chase some shit. Shit. She goes down to Spunky Monkey to watch a show. <laughs> And they unzip into bitches that have an even more on the table body standard. The show ends, Button Mom and Dad come to pick up Coraline, but YB is depresso espresso, so Button Mom tells him to put a smile on that face. But Coraline happy, and Button Mom tells her if she wants to keep having fun, they're gonna have to sew buttons into her eyes, and she's like, uh, fuck no. That's okay, we're gonna try again tomorrow when you wake up. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. What the fuck, what the fuck, what the fuck, what the fuck, what the fuck? She bolts up to her room, shuts up all the sentient toys she has, telling her to sew buttons into her fucking eyes. And why the hell do the friends in her picture have button eyes? That wasn't the case before. What the hell's changed? The button mom was always evil. Doesn't matter. She forces herself to go to sleep and wakes up in the middle of the night, still in the button world. So she goes down and tries to open the room that the tiny door's in, but it's locked. Then she finds Button Dad being creepy on the piano, and he starts talking shit about button mom, so the piano shuts him up. She gets scared and tries to run away. Dave shows up and he's like, told you she was a crazy hoe. And then they end up back at the house because this world's messed up like that. Dave kills a mouse that was sounding an alarm, which turns into a fat ass rat as soon as he kills it. Then she goes inside and unlocks the tiny door room by doing this. Pretty sure that's not how doors work, but okay. She gets in there, but the tiny door gets blocked by a heckin' buff roach. Room lights up and she finds Butt Mom sitting there. She eats a bug and Coraline goes, You one disgusting hoe, you know that? Take that back, suck my dick. Alright, listen here, you little brat. You ain't my mama. Bitch, I hope the fuck you do! Butt Mom turns into this bony ass, skank ass, bitch ass, 
Quirrell the Vil looking ass, motherfucker ass, demon spawn. And throws Coraline into a magic mirror and locks her in there. Where she finds three ghosts, so she goes up to talk to them and finds out that Button Mom uses this shape shifting doll to spy on their lives, see what they don't like, and lure them into this button world and give them all the stuff they like, and then try to suck their soul throughout their asshole or something. I don't know, man. So they were just like her, but crucially, they went through with the button surgery, which fucked them in the ass. And they ask her if she ever gets out of here to find their eyes if she can't. Then she gets pulled out the mirror by Button Y Beam. Home Dog's mouth got permanently sewed into a smile. Dude got fucking jokered, but he's here to help and he sends her through the anus that is now full of crap. She gets back to the normal house and no one is there. But YB's at the door. He's asking for the doll back because it belonged to his grandma's sister and Nana Man. She brings him in to look for the doll which she can't find and tells him all the shit that's been going on and he dips out of there because she thinks she's nuts. But she still can't find her parents anywhere so she goes down to Spunky and Bunky for help. Spunky jackhammers a bunch of candy into a triangle thing that's got a hole in it which Spunky says is good for lost things and Bunky says it's good for bad things. Coraline leaves and cries herself to sleep that night and gets woken up by Dave who shows her that her parents are trapped in the mirror. So she bangs really hard on it and breaks it and good job dipstick now they're trapped in there forever. Then Dave shows her the doll and now it looks like her mom and her dad so she burns it. Bravo kid. Bravo. It's a bit too late now but still you did it. Bravo. She takes these three things and the candy triangle, which I'm going to shorten to candy ang because I'm mad like that, and heads into the vacant sphincter to save her parents with Dave, who starts talking. He tells her to challenge the button bitch to a game, because she likes games. They go through, button mom gets a hold of Coraline, and just like Dave told her, Coraline challenges the mom to a game. And the game goes like this, button bitch gives her clue to the whereabouts of the dead children's eyes, and if she finds them and her parents, she lets them all go. If not, she sews buttons into her eyes. So Skeletor bitch agrees, Coraline goes on the hunt for the eyes, and finds out that the candy ang can see through shit and detect the kid's eyes or some shit like that, right? And the first set of eyes is the gear shifter for the buck copter, which the button dad gives her because he wants to help out, and the whole garden turns gray. I'm gonna assume for the sake of math that each ball is like a kinder surprise egg that houses two eyes in it for each kid. That or each kid had exactly one eye, okay? Next up, she goes down to Spunky and Bunky, and with the help of the candy ang, she identifies that this ring is the second set of eyes. And after some golem, my precious shit happens, she gets the second ball. And now onto Ivan, and he's like, Are you looking for this? Whoop, no, you can't have it. Why you want to live? It is fun here. We can have fun together. We don't understand all the problems. Then Ivan turns out to be puppeteered by rats. They disperse and run away and try to take the third ball away from her. But in an effort to stop them, she throws the candy ang at them, which misses completely. Coraline, you fucking moron. Why would you do that? You threw your most valuable tool in this world away. Why not throw anything else? Why would you throw that thing? You, you could see through walls with that shit. You have you threw away wall hacks. You fucking threw it. Oh my god. No worries though, because Dave finds a rat, kills it, and brings the ball. And he's like, you could thank me later. Everything starts turning gray. They go into the house and find Skeletor Buttonface, who throws wall hacks into the fire. Coraline scamazes her into opening the tiny door and finds her parents in a snow globe. Then she yeets Dave at the crazy witch, which gives her just enough time to sprint in that door. Come on, you can do that. Start Why are you not moving? Move, please. You just threw your only friend in this godforsaken fucking world at a crazy witch. Why are you not fucking moving? <laughs> Bone Lady gets blinded, some spider shit happens, Coraline escapes but the Bone Lady's hand gets cut off and lands in a dusty anal cavity and the rectum quickly collapses when she gets out of the other side. And now her parents are back, completely oblivious to what just happened, but nevertheless back to the world. That night Dave shows up pissed as hell looking at her like, bitch I said thank me later, not throw me out a goddamn witch later, what the fuck's wrong with you? She apologizes and it's all good, then she goes to bed and hallucinates the dead kid telling her to get rid of the key because it ain't safe. So she goes to throw the key down that old well from the beginning of the movie and at the same time Bone Lady scissor hand escapes from the sphincter and makes its way over to Coraline and attacks her but then YB shows up out of nowhere and helps her defeat and crush the scissor hands with a rock then they bundle it up with the rock tie the key to it throw it down the well and close it which is just absolutely retarded we've already seen that this thing can operate independently from a body that's in a different reality what's to stop it from regenerating or relinking itself taking the key and going open the door and wreaking havoc all over the world huh what's to say it can't do that if I were you I would take each and every single piece of that hand and spend the rest of my life traveling the whole planet and digging holes in the ground and putting them as far away from each other as I possibly can. I'd even try and contact my buddy Elon Musk, shoot in the fucking space, burn out in a furnace, whatever, just get rid of it permanently. This is a, such a bad solution. What's wrong with you? He says sorry for not believing her, and next day everybody does some gardening, and she invites his grandma over. This movie gets a shower cap out of a gamer girl bathwater.
Welcome to Frozen. First off, we got three main characters we gotta keep track of here. We got Anna, Elsa, and Kristoff. Okay, Anna and Elsa are princesses, and Kristoff is an ice dealer. I don't know what he calls his job. He deals in ice, like a weed dealer deals in weed. Okay, and they're all kids right now. So Anna goes to Elsa and wakes her up, and she's like, "Yo, let's go fucking play. Let's go build a fucking snowman, yo." And she's like, "I right, go use your ice powers and shit." Elsa uses her ice and snow powers to build a snowman and make a bunch of ice and snow. Okay, and Anna's having lots of fun skipping around, hopping from one small snow hill to another which Elsa keeps creating as she hops from one to another okay increasingly making them higher and higher and it gets out of hand and Elsa slips and accidentally headshots her own sister and then instead of yelling mom get the camera she yells mom help I shot my sister and might I just add that this could have all been avoided if you instead of making it higher and higher just make them lower and lower or just make a big ass patch of fluffy snow for her landing use your head man come on it's not that difficult anyway their parents come in in fucking royal clothing I know this is supposed to be a kids movie and this is made to point out that this is the king queen but still like you fucking sleep in royal attire what the shit why are you wearing this anyway they come in and they're like oh shit she's cold as fuck and then the dad's like i don't want to go and they ride off into the night on some dummy thick horses all right and they get to these stone trolls okay and one old ass stone troll comes in and he's like oh i can fix this don't worry about it and he fixes her head and removes all the memories of her sister ever having powers okay and advises them not to tell her that her sister has powers and keep it a secret from fucking everyone which they follow why though like why couldn't you just be like hey Listen, Elsa, what you did there was pretty fucking stupid. How about you don't do it again and just go on with your fucking life? What's the problem? I don't get it. He also tells Elsa that her powers are strong as fuck and also dangerous, but also cool, but also nice, but also whatever. You get it. They're all cool powers. Cool powers, okay? Tells her that you have to learn to control them. While all of this is happening, Kristoff and his trusty steed Sven, who is not actually a horse, he's a reindeer, are watching. And some stone troll lady decides to keep them. I'm gonna keep you. But... Can she even do that? Is no no one's gonna ask about this kid. Not even these guys. Do they know this kid or was he just tagging along? I don't get it. Who are they? Off point, off point, doesn't matter. Some time passes, Anna and Elsa grew up barely seeing each other at all. Elsa learns to very shittily conceal her powers. Their parents fucking die in a sea accident. Sea accident? Yeah, yeah, sea accident, whatever. Some more time passes and it's coronation day, okay? Elsa has finally of age to become the queen. And everybody across the land is coming because they're opening the gates up for the first time in a long time for this dope-ass coronation. And everybody's hella excited. Everybody except for Kristoff. Apparently he gives zero shits. Here. Disgusting! Anna is also hella excited. And she meets Prince Charming with sideburns. Elsa gets coronated and she almost loses her cool. Get it? Cool? Was this cool? Because she has ice powers and she... They have a ball and Anna falls in love with Cyburns here and they decide to get married. So she goes to her sister and she's like, uh, yeah, so I met this guy like uh, five minutes ago and uh, we decided to get married. Uh, can I have your blessing? And I was like, what the fuck, bitch? No, no, you just met this guy. Yeah, Anna, what the fuck? Anyway, they have a fight and Elsa fucking loses her cool and shows everybody that she has ice powers, gets really sad and then plunges the entire kingdom into an eternal winter and then runs away and hides in the mountains or escapes in the mountains in, or just she goes to the mountains and Anna goes after her right after being accused of being a witch and having powers as well by Nigel here which she doesn't but it brings up a good point why is Elsa the only one with ice powers did her dad have like a frostbitten penis or something and the only way to save his fucking dick was to have a baby right away hence giving Elsa the ice powers of his frostbitten penis is that theory too retarded she goes after her sister and leaves Cyburns here in charge. Another genius move, Anna. Why the fuck didn't you leave one of your kingsmen or fucking royal prime minister or whatever in charge? Someone you trust more than this person that you just met an hour ago. Not an hour ago, like, you just met that day, whatever. Elsa gets to a place called North Mountain, and she builds an ice castle on top of it while singing a super catchy and contagious song in the 50th musical number of this movie. I guess it's the 50th, I don't know, I lost count. And while Anna was on her way up to North Mountain, I don't know how she knows that her sister's on North Mountain, but she does. Who cares? She loses her horse, okay? Then she finds Kristoff, and she's like, Yo, Kristoff, take me up to my sister. And he's like, Alright, fine, later. Now. So they get to moving, and they get chased by some wolves. Then they make a sick jump, and Kristoff almost falls off a cliff. But then he gets saved by Anna when she throws him a pickaxe that has a rope attached to the end of it. And if she threw that just a little bit harder, that shit would have been through his brain right now. They keep on going, and they meet Olaf, a snowman that her sister created while she was singing that contagious ass song, okay? A snowman that is savage as fuck. And who's the funky? looking donkey over there that's Sven uh-huh and who's the reindeer loves summer and is completely oblivious to the fact that snow melts when it gets hot winter's a good time to stay in and cuddle but put me in summer and I'll be a happy snowman 
They get to the castle. Anna goes up to Elsa and she's like, hey, you kind of froze everything over. Can you please undo this shit? And she's like, bitch, you think I can undo this shit? You think I control this shit? And then she loses her shit and shoots some ice into her sister's heart. Then she builds another huge ass snowman. This time he's evil. And he tells him to fuck off and chases them off a cliff. And how the fuck did Sven get here so fast? Or at all even. I mean, they just fell off a cliff. Doesn't matter. Anna's hair is turning white, okay? And she's getting increasingly colder because of the ice in her heart. So Kristoff decides to take her to his family who can fix this. He says, I've seen them do it before. Uh, hey Kristoff, buddy, how are you not making the connection here? She was little girl all these years ago. So they get to his family and he starts talking to a bunch of fucking rocks. And Olaf's like, yo, he crazy. But then the rocks transform into trolls and they immediately decide that Anna and Kristoff will be perfect for each other and they should get married right fucking now. But then Anna's like, oh shit, I'm dying. So the old troll comes and gives his diagnosis and he's like, mm, I can't fix this shit. Only an act of true love can fix this because obviously it's a Disney movie. So they figure, all right, let's get her back to Sideburns and he can give her a true love's kiss and fix this shit. So they haul ass back to the kingdom. Kristoff drops her off and then promptly fucks off. Anna gets to Sideburns and she's like, kiss me right fucking now. Damn, oh, shit, shit that's that's a horny horny beach. I'm dying right now and the only thing that can fix it is true love's kiss because Disney. What's a Disney? So they're about to kiss but then Cyburns is like Soik! And then he begins to explain his evil motives, okay? See, he has 12 brothers, that means he's 12 to 9 for the throne. His throne, not her throne. So he thought he'd just marry into another fucking royal family and get their kingdom. But it's fucking practically impossible to marry Elsa because she's such a loner and isolated herself. So he tried with her, with Anna, and then stage an accident and fucking kill Elsa and then become king. So he then puts out the fire, locks the door, and then goes off to kill Elsa. You see, after her horse left her, uh, he found the horse and then decided to go up and see what's going down. Down, and he captured Elsa and put her in a cell down in the dungeon somewhere. So he went down to kill her, but then she froze the fucking cell, shattered it, and escaped and started a blizzard. And he starts running after her and trying to kill her. Kristoff sees this blizzard going down from afar and he's like, oh shit, I gotta go back. Then he runs back. Meanwhile, Olaf finds Anna in this huge ass castle. He must have opened every single door before he found her. And he finds her freezing to death and her hair is almost completely white. So he starts a fire and gets her next to the fire and almost melts. And then goes like, some people are worth melting for. My god, fucking love you Olaf. Olaf mentions how Hans might have not have been her true love and Kristoff might have been her true love and then he sees him coming so they try and go down to the blizzard and meet him halfway. So right now there are four people in the blizzard on the frozen sea. Cyburns, Elsa, Anna and Kristoff. And Cyburns gets to Elsa and he's like yo you killed your sister because of that ice you put in her heart. So she drops to the ground crying and he unseathes his sword or something and is about to strike her and kill her. Anna sees this and she's almost frozen and she stands between him and her sister and in that instant she freezes while he's striking her and the sword shatters and that must be the luckiest shit ever because if she froze before she had been frozen mid sprint and her sister dies and if she froze after she had been split in half right now Elsa turns around and she's like oh my god my sister she's frozen fuck no and then she hugs her and cries on her shoulder and then Anna turns back to normal because that is considered an act of love and Elsa's like oh shit that's right love and she suddenly can control her powers really? just like that? that's all it took? You're now an expert. So Elsa turns everything back to normal and gives Olaf his own little personal snow cloud so he doesn't melt in the summer. Cyburns eat shit, they all go ice skating, and that is not how ships work. That's pure bullshit. I give this movie 10 snowballs out of 7 Cyburns. Welcome to Ice Age and we got Scrat doing Scrat stuff with his nut and almost dying several times. Then we got a bunch of animals migrating for the winter and Manny the Mammoth going the other way cause fuck society, he marches to the drum of his own beat. That is backwards. Then we get to see character number 2 which is Shed the Sloth who got abandoned by his herd cause he's a retard then angers a couple of rhinos by spoiling their salad. Then he runs away from them into Manny who is immediately annoyed by him but tries to save him nevertheless. Okay look. If either of you make it across that sinkhole in front of you, you get the sloth. The fact that they're even considering this to be a true fact after seeing Sid run across it to get to Manny just tells me that these rhinos are even more fucking stupid than Sid. No matter though, because Sid reestablishes his superior retardation by showing that Manny was bluffing. There ain't no sinkhole, so Manny fights off the rhinos and saves Sid, who then decides to stick to Manny and accompany him on his travels because of safety reasons, to which Manny responds with, Hey, oh, fuck off, man, stop following me. But Sid Word is one persistent comrade and proceeds to stick to him like shoe on a gum. That is also backwards. Cut to a human settlement and a bunch of saber-toothed tigers planning to attack and leader cat wants a tiny human alive because some some they wiped out half of our pack some some uh, revenge some some 
Yeah. And the feline responsible for getting the baby is Diego. We attack at dawn, says the bitch, and then we cut to Manny and Sid building shelter and bonding, sort of. Scrat almost dying again, and I'm not gonna even try and count on how many times this rat was supposed to die, because let's be real here, if you've seen the movies, you know this motherfucker is invincible. Also, according to cartoon movie physics, this nut should have turned to a popcorn from that lightning. Just saying. Moving on, dawn has arrived, and the kitties attack. Human mama protect Ice Age baby from Diego. He corners her by the edge of a waterfall, so faced with no other options, she goes, fuck it. Yo! Then after the kitties regroup, leader kitties like, where the fuck the baby at, man? The bitch jumped off a cliff, man. I don't know what to tell you, dude. You bring me back that baby or else I'm gonna fucking turn to some mince meat, motherfucker. I'm right, fine, man. Jeez, okay? I'm gonna bring that back baby. Calm your titties. So the gang splits up and the humans follow the big pack thinking that they have the baby or the killer or something. Meanwhile, downstream, Manny and Sid find the female and she gives him the infant, then disappears. How does this baby not have hypothermia? And where's his mom's body? Don't corpses float? Hmm. Okay, so apparently it takes a while for it to float, like three days, because of biology, decomposition, whatever. My bad. Moving on. So it's like, we gotta take this thing back up to its herd up there. You see smoke and stuff? Yeah, nah, I'm not doing that. Go fuck yourself. Fine, I'm doing myself. You know, I like to see that numbnuts. So Sid gives it his best shot at climbing the side of the waterfall. A valiant effort, Sid. Then he drops the child, and Diego arrives like, uh, I want that thing, it's mine. And they're like, <laughs> nah, I don't think so. And Manny decides to help Sid return the baby to the humans so that the taiki waggy doesn't eat it. And they get up there to the smoke uh, on top of the hill or on top of the waterfall, and the humans have left on the way to Glacier Pass because of winter. And Diego arrives like, you'll never get there before the pass closes up. I can track them, let me have the baby, and I will make sure to personally deliver it to humans very safely. No way, Jose, we're going with you so you don't eat it. So they travel as a pack together. And on their journey, the little comeback won't stop crying, so they check his diaper for the poopies but it turns out to be clean and they throw it away and they just threw away their only clean diaper and the movie will continue to act like this little shit machine doesn't take a dump throughout the entirety of the rest of the movie whatever baby's still crying so they get it some food by fighting off some dodos for a watermelon in an epic game of rugby baby eat and they sleep that night but diego will be fake sleeping and he tried to steal the little shit machine when everybody else is asleep but he hears a noise so he goes to check it out and it turns out to be a few members of his pack Okay, if you're rustling Lee's prompts Manny in his sleep to tighten his grip on the baby, then this fucking huge ass tiger war should totally wake him up. But it doesn't, who cares? Diego has a meeting with Cat on Crack and Discount Scar and tells him that he's not just bringing a baby for dinner, but also a mammoth and a walking bag of toxic waste, aka Sid, and tells them to tell the leader bitch to prepare for an ambush on Manny or something like that later on. Okay, so he goes to sleep and next day baby is gone, but don't worry, Sid was only using it as a chick magnet. And he gets chased by the gay wino couple, Diego saves him by pretending to eat him, and then we get a travel montage where Diego finds a singular tiger footprint and replaces it with a human track that's right one just the one in this entire fucking snowy wilderness mm -hmm, accurate whatever they go ice skating then play pictionary with scrat where he tries to warn them that they're gonna get anally defiled by a bunch of saber tooth tigers but they no get it because they are super fucking dense also diego takes care of them they keep moving and diego sees the humans before Sid and manny so he's like hey yeah i found a shortcut in this cave let's take it and they are forced in there because of a mini avalanche and almost die via impalement from a bunch of hanging icicles why are you guys standing still? The icicles are clearly only at the entrance of this fucking cave. All you have to do is walk in a bit more and you're safe. It doesn't require that much brain power, you fucking shit beans. Anyway, they walk in, some funny memes happen, a Star Trek reference, then Square accidentally goes onto an icy slip and slide, so they go after him to save him, and... <laughs> How, and I mean, how in the Kentucky Fried fuck did that baby make it through that part without dying? Doesn't matter. Rides over and Diego goes, Who's up for round two? Shut the fuck up, homie. You basically shit yourself the whole way through. They keep going and find some cave paintings and learn about Manny's past. Either he lost his wife and kid, or he lost his mom and dad. Or third option, this isn't even his story and he's just really empathetic. Next, they make it out of the shortcut cave and get pretty close to Glacier Pass when lava starts fucking the ice from beneath. Starts smelling it and shit. And Diego almost dies trying to escape, but Manny saves him and in doing so, almost dies himself. And Diego's like, why'd you do that, man? You could've died. Because, Diego, the power of friendship. Oh man, I love you, man. I love you too. They keep moving, but it's too cold so they tuck in for the night and the baby takes its first steps does cute stuff and pulls on Diego's heartstrings they all go to bed and Scratch shows up like 
Oh, now it turns into a popcorn. Sure, fire makes more sense, but according to cartoon science, lightning still should have done the trick movie. Fuck you. Next day comes and they start moving and make their way to where the pack of Liptars want to ambush them. And Diego tells them about the ambush because he's a good guy now. And Manny gets mad and wants to fucking kill Diego, but he's like, okay, listen, I have a plan. We can fix this. I'm on your side now. I'm on your side, okay? So they believe him and use Sid and the baby as bait to get these three retards to go after him, but Sid uses his expert snowboarding skills to get away until he doesn't and loses the baby, but it turns out to be a psych, not a baby. Wait a minute, where the fuck did they get the baby? baby quilt form or like the baby wrapping thing yeah the baby wrapping whatever where they get that from last time i saw it was when sid dropped squirrel where they keep it till this moment inside sid's asshole fuck that i got bullshit anyway tagis get cucked and the three stooges get surprise attacked by manny sid gets the baby from hiding and then fuck cat on crack in the ass then the rest of the pussies try to corner and attack manny but diego do the defending and takes a bullet for manny metaphorical bullet he actually takes a bite okay then manny kill the leader cunt via falling ice and the rest of the pussies run away because they are indeed pussies and they check on diego who's kind of dying right now except i see no blood but uh you know Oh, it's a kid's movie understandable i'm just a dickhead here anyway they're like sorry you're dying bro but we kind of gotta run and give this baby back to the humans they get to the past and just about catch human dad being sentimental and shit manny reaches for the baby dude goes into attack stance and manny be like motherfucker i'm trying to give you back your baby give me that shit Come on, give me that shit guy thinks he's about to get fucked but then manny reaches behind and gets his baby and he's surprised as fuck calls off the other people who trying to attack manny he's like whoa however given this shot just a second ago i ask where the fuck was the baby answer probably hanging for dear life off the right side of manny i don't know why they just do it this way okay i mean we already know that manny and sid have the baby in trying to return it and the dad would have been just as surprised if it were riding in its usual spot because he wouldn't be able to see it because of manny's huge stature and his killer weave wait a minute was the baby hiding inside his killer weave? Never mind. Baby walks back to Dada. They are reunited. Cute shit. Fun stuff. Really happy for you, my guy. Just remember, your wife's still dead, though. Baby gives Sid and Manny a goodbye hug, and the fugly dad gives them a little shitty necklace that they'll lose in literally under two minutes. Or maybe they shove it up Sid's ass for safekeeping. Or hide it in Manny's killer weave again. I don't know. Anyway, Diego shows up because he's not dead. His but a flesh wound. He says goodbye to and Sid and Manny find out he's alive and they're really happy about it. Also, check it out. No, no necklace. See that? Unimportant, though. Mission is a success. The baby's back and they walk off. Best buds. Also, Scrat gets for 20,000 years and finds a coconut. This movie gets five sunflower seeds out of seven pistachios. Welcome to Wally, where the planet is trash. Okay, planet Earth is literally trash. Well, not literally, it's covered in garbage, okay? And it's too toxic to live on, so humans were forced to abandon ship and go live in space on these big massive spaceships produced by a company called Benil, and they left behind a bunch of robots called wall es to clean up the place so they can come back in a few years' time and fix up Earth. Now all these wall es are dead, except for one, our main boy Wally here. He's still kicking clean up the Earth for our grateful asses with his little cockroach buddy. And he survived all this time by hiding from dust storms in a bigger wall e and taking replacement parts from other non-functioning wallies. So he's basically living inside his fallen brothers and stealing their body parts. I don't know why I was so compelled to point that out. So he goes home where he keeps a bunch of shit that interests him and deposits some more interesting stuff that he found on his day. And that is some bullshit right there because there's no way he found just six spoons and seven forks throughout all these years. Anyway, he's playing a random old movie and we find out that our boy Wally here is looking for love. He's looking for some McLovin' baby. He, he lonely, you know? Then a dust storm hits him and he closes the door, goes to sleep, wakes up next morning with a super low battery level so he goes to charge himself off from the sun, then heads off to work after nearly killing his only friend. So he at work compacting some trash and finding some random shit that he wants to take home with him, and then he finds a plant. So he digs it out of the ground and puts it in a shoe to take home with him. How he knew to do that and not just rip it out the fucking ground? I don't know. In fact, now that I think about it, how the fuck does a plant even grow inside a fridge? They know someone in there. So he goes home and he finds a red dot, and apparently he has a built-in cat module or some shit because he runs after that dot. And as it turns out, that dot is a landing mark of one of Elon Musk's fancy self-landing rockets. Then he digs a to the ground and buries himself to avoid burning to death from the fucking flaming rocket. Then the rocket opens up and releases, wait for it, an egg. Then it fucks off and once again, so he doesn't burn to death, he hides himself in the ground. Which honestly, I don't think he should have survived this or the one before. There's just no way he can dig a hole deep enough to escape the heat of that fucking rocket. And as much as I love this movie, there is just so many occasions where Wally should have just flat out fucking died. So to get that out of the way, I'm going to show them all here right now. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Now, back to the egg, and it's scanning the place looking for something, and it will kill anything that moves. Okay, I understand that they're playing on the gag that cockroaches can survive a nuclear blast and shit, but I'm pretty sure by that they mean the radiation, not the blast itself. This thing should be dead, right? 
right? Anyway, the egg also attempts to murder Wally multiple times before it decides that Wally is not a threat. That, however, does not stop Wally from looking at her like, I'm a tap dead ace. So the egg keeps scanning shit while ignoring Wally who's being a creepy stalker right now. Then it gets frustrated because it ain't fine what it came looking for. And after getting stuck in a magnet, it blows up and destroys five oil tankers. Wally sees this and he decides that now is the time for him to shoot his shot, baby. He's going for it. And he finds out that her name is Eva. That's right, it's a she. I think. I don't know. Then a dust storm hits and Wally decides to take her back to his pad for safety. I'd say this is going perfectly for Wally so far. So he takes her home and the crazy ass bitch tries to blow a hole through his wall. And he shows her some of the stuff in his interesting collection of random shit. Then he shows her the movie from earlier and tries to teach her how to fucking dance. But this crazy ass hole nearly ruins his house and almost kills him. Listen, my guy, I know you're lonely. But this one crazy ass bitch, dude. Anyway, she only busts his eye up and he goes over to his stuff and gets a replacement part and fixes himself easy. He tries to hold her hand and she's like, nah. She sees the hand holding part in the movie and he shows her one last thing, the plant. And it turns out that the plant is exactly what she's looking for. So she sucks it up and shuts down. And Wally's like, uh, the fuck just happened? And he's super concerned. So he tries to turn her back on to no avail. Then he cares for her and then goes on dates with her unconscious body. No, the usual. Till one day he decides to go back to work. And on that day, Elon Musk's rocket comes back to take Eva. So he rushes back and tells his buddy to stay put while he hangs on for dear life while they exit the trash filled atmosphere and travel through space till they get to the Axiom, which is the main and biggest human colony spaceship place in space colony for people. Yeah. Sounds about right. The rocket docks inside the spaceship and lines up a bunch of Evas to get cleaned by a bunch of robots that Wally keeps annoying. Then the 5-0 takes Wally's Eva because she got the plant. So he follows her and leaves a trail of muddy tracks behind him. And the main cleaning robot really wants to clean it, but he has to stay on the predetermined line. So he's like, Disrespect your surroundings! Fuck the system. And starts cleaning up the tracks, but he does not start from the beginning. Fucking idiot. So while he's still following Eva, he fucks with traffic, then he gets his first glimpse of the modern human, who are basically fat blobs of mass stuck to their hover chairs with their eyes glued to the screens of their infotainment systems, completely oblivious to their surroundings. Much like me, except my chair doesn't float. So one of the fat fucks gets knocked over and Wally helps him up, then he gets on a train that Eva's on, and he tries to get to her, but this fat bitch is in the way, so he's like, hey, hey, hey lady, woman, woman! Oh shit, uh. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Wally. Can you please move out the fucking way? I'm trying to get to my girl. Thank you. So the 5-0 escort Wally and Eva to the captain's headquarters, and as it turns out, humans fucked up the Earth so bad that they spent 700 years in space. And their bone density right now is basically non-existent because they spent so long in microgravity. However, they made it pretty goddamn obvious that they have some sort of artificial gravity, so this shouldn't happen. This doesn't make any sense. I am confusion. Anyhow, now that there's finally signs of life on Earth, they can go back and rebuild it. So they start up Eva, and while this dipsh is trying to figure out how to read a book, Eva finds out that Wally has followed her here from Earth. Then the captain figures out that they have to put a plant in some plant activation chamber thing that will activate the let's go home protocol that's what I'm calling it so they open up Eva and they find nothing plants gone and the captain's like well I guess we ain't going nowhere and thinks that Eva is a defective robot so he sends her to get fixed then he gets startled by Wally and Wally's like sup I'm Wally nice to meet you and here's some dirt so the captain also orders for Wally to be cleaned Eva and Wally get to the robot fixing place and they start running diagnostics on Eva I think but that's not what it looks like to Wally he thinks they're torturing her so he frees himself and then goes to free Eva and then accidentally frees all the fucked up robots in the place who praise him because he freed them. And they run wild with him in the streets till they get stopped by the Popo, who deem Eva and Wally fugitives of the law. So Eva takes Wally to an escape pod so she can send them back to Earth, but then the fuzz shows up with the plant. And they want to send it off into space and blow it up using the pod's self-destruct mechanism. And Wally's like, hey, Eva, check it out, the plant! <laughs> So Wally accidentally gets launched out with a plant and Eva goes after him while he freaks out and tries to get out the fucking pod, but he explodes and dies. Psych! He does not die. My boy Wally made it out in time with a fire extinguisher and he flies over to Eva. And not only did he live, but he also got the plant with him, baby, and Eva is chuffed to bits. So she hugs him and their heads do this little bzzz thing and I have no idea what that means, but he likes it. Then they fly out in space and have some fun, cause they ain't in no rush, they ain't no deadline on this shit. They get back on the ship and all the while Wally just really wanted to hold her hand like in the movie. But she's hyper focused on getting that plan up to the captain. So she tells him to stay put while she goes up to trash you to the captain who has been binge watching videos about Earth ever since he analyzed the dirt that Wally put in his hand. And the captain takes the plant and puts a projector thing on Eva's head to see what Earth is like right now. And he finds out that it is, as I said before, garbage. So he's like, we have to go back and care for Earth and fix it up and shit. While Eva gets to see how Wally cared for her when she was shut off, and it is cute as fuck. Then the autopilot comes down to take the plan away from the captain because it is revealed that a few years after the axiom took off, the president of Benil or the president of America. America, whatever, I don't care. Some dude sent a message saying that the earth is too fucked to come back and it's way too toxic, never come back. And he basically left the chip, the chip, and he basically left the sip, 
the SIP, and he basically left the ship in charge of the autopilot. But now, obviously, it's not that toxic because boom, plant. But the autopilot don't care, so I guess the police to throw the plant down the trash chute. But lo and behold, everybody, because Wally's climbing up the trash chute, and he tries to keep the plant away from the autopilot while Eva is held back by the police. But the autopilot electrocutes him, and somehow, although he was literally struck by lightning twice before and came out fine, this damages him. Fuck logic. Anyway, Wally gets thrown out of the trash, and they turn off Eva and throw her down with him. So a little while later, we cut to the garbage dump where Eva gets rebooted by mice. What the fuck are those things? Eva and Wally get trash compacted by bigger Wallies, but this time they're Wallas because they're on the Axiom, and the E in Wally stands for Earth, and these are unimportant details. Why am I talking about this? Moving on, because they're about to get thrown into space. But remember that stupid little cleaning robot that was so insistent on cleaning his tracks? Well, that's one persistent stupid little cleaning robot because he found Wally and he wants his ass. So he sprints over to the airlock doors and wedges himself in there, and with the help of the bigger Wallas, Eva and Wally get saved. Now, throughout all of this, I have just one question: How the fuck do you find materials for anything on the ship if you throw out this much trash? So Wally's got some sort of fucked circuit board or some shit, which means he's dying. Hold up, that's the damage? Man, Wally shouldn't even be functional. I can stick my finger through that shit. And Eva is worried as fuck, scouring the trash, looking for replacement parts that all won't work. So Wally hands her the plant so she can put it in the plant chamber return thing so they can go back to planet Earth. But she's like, nah, let's hold hands. Bitch, I'm dying here. Ain't no time for that shit. We gotta go back to planet Earth and find me some replacement parts, dumbass. So that finally clicks in her head and they bust out of there and they fuck up the police with the help of the defective robots. The captain fights the autopilot and he opens up the plant chamber go home thing and even while they're flying over to the thing so they can put the plant in it but last second the autopilot tilts the entire ship to the side preventing them from doing that and knocking the plant out of their hands. And I don't even know why this is a feature in the ship. I mean you're standing still in fucking space. Why do you need to do this? Why is this an option? Anyway Eva sets Wally down and goes to look for the plant but then gets occupied by saving a bunch of people from a falling train. Then the autopilot presses the button that closes the plant hatch but feeble little Wally's there and he's trying to hold the hatch open with all his might. Then the autopilot presses the button hard and as we all know pressing the button harder is 100% effective in getting the thing done better. And the hatch closes harder and it wedges Wally and destroys him and all our hearts fucking sink. But then the captain stands up I don't know how he has celery sticks for bones in his legs but that doesn't matter he stands up and he turns off the autopilot levels the ship Eva puts the plan through the gap in the plan thing and sees the extent of Wally's damage and he's he's fucked. Then they hyper jump back to earth they get there Eva takes Wally and she zooms over to his house and finds replacement parts and tries to fix him up as fast as he can she's performing open heart surgery on this motherfucker at supersonic speed. Then she blasts the hole through his roof so he can charge via solar panels which like why just take him up to the roof why you have to fucking blow up my man's house like that come on dude. Anyway he charges up and turns on and he does not recognize her. It's, it's, he's gone man there's no more Wally the lights are on but no one's home. So she tries to jog his memory with some of his old stuff but it doesn't work man he just compacts it. and that's one strong light bulb what the fuck. Doesn't matter he goes out and finds some more trash to compact and then she goes over one last time to try and shake it out of him but nothing. So she holds his hand and rests her head against his and then that little spark happens and I still have no clue what it does or what it means but I sure as hell don't give a fuck because it brought Wally back baby and the movie ends with the humans being able to rebuild the earth and all that fun jazz but who cares will you the important thing here is Wally why is all good 10 out of 10 10 out of 10 Anybody who hates this movie can suck a dick, I don't even care. 10 out of 10. Welcome to Zootopia. It starts with a bunny making a school play about how animals that are predators are now cool with animals that are prey. They're getting along just fine. Now they stand on two feet and can be anything they want. And she wants to be a cop, which scares the bejeebus out of her parents because they are with bags and try to persuade her to let go of her hopes and dreams and aspirations and become a giant loser like them. And they're 275 kids and just farm carrots all day. If they have 275 kids, even if the older ones help out sometimes and take care of the younglings, there's no way they can give all of them the same attention that they're giving Judy right now. Which means Judy's their favorite child or their horrible parents parents or both actually why not anyway she's like let everybody dream motherfuckers and she wanders off to go protect these kids from a bully wolf that tries to steal the tickets that's not a wolf that's a fox listen i'm gonna get a lot of animals confused in this video okay i'm a dumbass I'm just saying this right now so fox ends up clawing her face this does not leave a scar by the way and she gets up with the tickets and gives them back and vows to become a police officer because she's a stubborn dumb bitch then we cut to 15 years later she in cop training and this bear goes zootopia has 12 unique ecosystems and you have to train for all of them but we're only going to show you training on the hot one the cold one and the rainy one because we can't be fucked to show the audience more. 12 ecosystems, my ass. Whatever, Judy keeps filling up the courses but then trains in the sunset and watches Rocky and starts doing well at them and passes. Cool moves, right? But what happens when you don't have a bunch of retards standing around that you can abuse to get over a giant wall of ice? Honestly, this should count as cheating, but the polar bear is a dense motherfucker and doesn't say shit. She passes, and the mayor, who's a lion, couldn't be more on the nose with this shit, could you? All right, he comes to her fucking cop graduation ceremony thing because she's the first ever bunny and it's dope shit first bunny. And her parents try to give her gifts, protective gifts, before she leaves to the big city, which is Utopia. Like this fox taser. How's a fox taser different from any regular one? Doesn't matter. She takes some fox spray as a compromise and goes on a train to Utopia, which isn't that far away because it only takes her one whole song 
long to get there and we see only three ecosystems where are the nine you cunt she makes it to new her apartment which is just a bedroom sick stuff bro then gets her first day of work and apparently there's bunny racism in this movie because you can't call a bunny cute it's offensive for whatever fucking reason then she goes to roll call and no way, nah. In this scenario, she slides off the slippery seated chair and the chair doesn't move a fucking inch off the ground. Ever heard of physics or friction, you Garfunkel twats? Whatever, Chief Bogroll comes in to do roll call. They got 14 missing memo cases, so we divide them up among the officers. I thought detectives were supposed to deal with this fucking detective stuff. This is detective stuff, right? Doesn't matter, Julie doesn't get a case and she gets assigned parking duty instead and she's like, this bitch! And tries to go get one of the missing memo cases, but he's just like, nope, don't care. So she decides to prove her worth by ticketing a lot of parkings. That sounds right and wrong at the same time, in my head. So parkings are getting ticketed when she sees a sly fox that is up to no good so she follows him into this ice cream shop and it turns out that he just wants to buy an ice cream jumbo pop thing for his son but is being faced by some fox faces and by this elephant like me, me, me. what does the fox say me, look at me all i can do is reference that memes and now i'm relatable <laughs> i'm so sad Officer Judy Plops sees this discrimination, won't stand for it, and she's like, Hey, fat fuck, serve this kind of fox or whatever pop where I'ma tell on you for serving the ice cream with a side of boogers on it, you fucking fat cunt. So Dumbo agrees and she buys them a jumbo cock and talks to the little kid like, You wanna be an elephant when you grow up? You be an elephant. Because this is utopia. Anyone can be anything. No, he can't, Judy. It's physically impossible. Don't be lying, Judy. Then later on, while being a parking ticket menace, she spots them melting the jumbo shit on a rooftop somewhere. Then she follows them to see them freezing it in the cold district or whatever. Then telling them to stupid business hamsters and keeping the sticks and sending them as construction material to mice. And this dude is actually full grown midget fox or some different type of fox. Maybe I saw him watching National Geographic. I don't actually know what he is. So she confronts Nick the dick and he does a magic trick. And I'm not the liar. He is. He wasn't even running with that. Fucking Houdini Fox, everybody. Anyway, she tries to arrest him for some stuff, but he's like, I'm about to whip a nana on your ass. Watch this. Ooh, see that? See that? Ooh, necessary permits, bitch. Suck my ass. Then he gives her a reality check and calls her a dumb bunny. And she's like, I'm not a dumb bunny. And he's like, right, and that's not what it's meant. Why did you only start sticking when he said that? She was standing there for like a good 20 seconds. Doesn't matter. She goes home defeated that day and FaceTimes her parents. And they find out that she's a meter mate and they're like, oh, shit, that's a criminal. Oh Next day, everybody hates her because no explanation needed. No one likes to get a ticket. And how the fuck is this mouse going to transport that ticket? Even if he folds it, it'll take up half his car. Actually, I have many questions about Zootopia. Like, is the death rate for rodents and cars sky high? Because even with their own lane, they're getting fucking squished, right? And are all predators now vegan? Like, where do they get their fucking protein? What do they eat? Are eggs still a thing? Butter? Milk? Is that cow cyst? Chicken cysts? Did they go to court for that stuff? Like, honey in the bee movie? A lot of unanswered questions, man. Anyway, back to point. The weasel steals some shit from a pig and it's Judy's time to shine. So she gives chase of the weasel and once again all laws of physics and gravity get bent over and raped by a fucking cactus because the weasel throws the stolen goods over the road and town fence and it should clearly continue in an arc like fashion in this direction but instead he crawls through the entrance and it drops like a rock then they have a chase in tiny mouse town and these buildings must have no foundation for them to do with this domino shit effect then judy saves the mouse from a donut and then arrests the weasel with the same lot of dough and brings him back to the police station only to get chewed out by chief butthole for doing all this reckless shit only to stop a weasel from stealing a few not onions then a lady otter comes in like please find me husband and bunny be like i'll find him for you then bogo's like oh you will do no such thing but it says that mayor bellwether comes in like yes she will and he's like oh fuck my ass he doesn't believe in her right and he gives her 48 hours to find emmett daughter and if she doesn't find him then she quits challenge accepted she says and she starts working on the case with her limited clues and she gets lucky because in the picture she has she finds him sucking on some dick i mean a popsicle from nick's popsicle stand so she finds nick and see she's in the mouse lane they have to swerve to get out of the way if this were rush hour she killed like seven mice there anyway nick wants her to fuck off because time is money and he'd be making 200 dollar readings every single day since he was 12 so she makes some quick maths and figures out that he made over a million dollars in profit and paid zero tax which is illegal as shit and she recorded everything he said on a plastic carrot pen and if he's so rich then why isn't he on bigger and better hustles or retired what a fucking stupid dumbass fox anyway if he doesn't want to go to jail and get the carrot recorder he'll have to help her on this case and midget fox comes out laughing like she hustle you good so nick takes her to the last place he shot shipment otter guy which is a nudist natural club but there ain't no genitalia shown because kids and we so just pretend there's a bunch of dicks and twats all over the place and they luck out again because they get a lot of info from this fucking guy i don't know what he is but he tells them that Emmy got into a limo and the fucker even remembers the license plate of the limo fucking lucky as shit some fucking cow doo doo right there but okay she's not into ZPD system yet so she can't use the zip pick dick resources and she can't run a plate but Nick knows a lot of people and she once again twists his hand into helping her so he's like alright bitch I got a pal the DMV it takes it to DMV and they're all sloths comedy wise funny gag mate DMV slow what a knee slapper mate but logic wise who in their right mind would think this was a good idea whatever he takes her to his guy and he wastes a lot of time for her and they finally run the plate at the end of the day but they still go to 
the limo service place, which is locked now, cause no shit, it's the end of the day. And she has no work to be in there, so she goes, all right, here's your hair, and throws it over the fence, and he climbs over, and she digs under and gets the care before he does. And she's like, pretty sure I just saw a scum of the earth lowlife criminal climb over the fence, so I have probable cause to be in here, so onwards with my investigation, bitch. And Nick's balls stay at the end of a very short leash, and I'm 99% sure that there exists rule 34 porn of what I just said. They find the limo, it's unlocked. What kind of retard business doesn't lock their limos, even their own parking lot, space, compound, whatever place? Doesn't matter. They investigate, and Nick goes, oh, fuck onions, this is Mr. Big's car, we gotta get out of here, because I'm not exactly on good terms with him, so we gotta go. Oh, they, shit. they get taken by some polar bears, turns out Nick sold Mr. Big a little skunk's ass, and when they get to wherever the polar bears are taking them, we find out that Mr. Big's actually a mouse, and we get a nice little godfather bit, like, you come into my house, the day my daughter is meant to be married. Why is he Russian? He's not Russian. Then he tries to kill them, but Azar comes in like, ah, oh, shit, dad, that's just cop that saved my life from that donut. And now, because she saved his daughter Judy's best friends with Mr. Big, and he tells him what he knows about Emmett the Otter, which is that he went bonkers in the limo and attacked a driver. So they go over to the drive in the rainforest district to do some more digging. And driver's eye is all scratched up. And he tells him something about night howlers. And when he opens the door for them, he turns savage. And for some reason now, he can use his fucked eye because wild animals have no emotions and they don't feel pain. Very well known fact. Anyway, he attacks them and they try to run away and she calls for backup, but only gets to the obese cheetah receptionist. Is that because she's not in the system yet or whatever? Or does everyone who calls for backup get connected to the front desk? That's just stupid. Don't matter. They shackle up the driver and escape him. And hell of a response time for the roses. They come over and go to see the savage Jay. But he's not there anymore. She's like, what? And Chief Ho Ho tells her, you had 48 hours, now hand in your badge. But Nick's like, she will do no such thing. You gave her 48 hours, right? So that means we got 10 left to find daughter. So that's what we're gonna do. Good day. But I said good day, sir. They get into this thing and she thanks him for sticking up for her. And he tells her that when he was a kid, he was a victim of Fox racism. And he gets a brainwave that they can use the buttload of security cameras all around the city to see where the Jaguar went. So they go to Assistant Mayor Sheep to use her computer because she has access to all the cameras, apparently. I don't know if that's a thing Assistant Mayors can do, but I don't give a fuck. She gets called in by Mayor Ryan hard to be abused by him and then Nick and Judy check out all the cams and see that two wolves came over to take the jaguar. Then they did a howl so they're the not howlers and put them in the car drove around a bit and drove over to this generic evil lair on a cliff slash waterfall number nine. So Judy and Nick go over there and sneak past the guards who are too busy howling and sneak into the evil lair place through the shit shoot. Turns out this is an old hospital and they go snoop around a bit and find a bunch of caged savage animals. Driver's there and so is Otterton and all the other missing mammal cases too. Then they hide because the mayor walks in with this doctor mole hedgehog some animal I don't fucking know and they start talking can see animals been going savage and they don't know why so he collects them for study and to fix them and put them back on the streets but they can't fix them because they don't know what's wrong with them doctor doesn't know what's wrong with them. and she goes on to say that since they're all predators this might have something to do with their genetics and he doesn't want that to get out because no doink he's a fucking lion it's gonna look bad for him i just realized that means that otters are predators which i can't believe just look at them they're so cute did you know that otters hold hands in the water so they don't drift apart when they're asleep that's fucking adorable anyway judy been filming this whole convo and gets a call from her lame ass parents ruining their stealth mission so the place goes on lockdown and the guards come in but once again they use a shit shoot to their advantage and escape the way Judy calls Boho, the cops come, the mayor gets arrested like, you don't understand, I was just trying to protect this city, shut up, pube man. Then we fade to a press conference where Judy gives Nick the pen and an officer application form because she could use a partner, yeah, let's just forget it.